Hello and welcome to another uh, revision video where we're going to be talking about the machines section of your unit. So if you remember the test that's coming up, you've got machines section and you have the birth section. And so the machines, machines sections will be talking about um, diagnosis and treatment. And so you can use this to kind of go over the materials that we talked about in class and kind of maybe quiz yourself and see how much you remember uh, as you get ready uh, for your next test. So if you remember how we started off this whole unit, we are thinking that we are, because we're nurses, looking uh, or working in a hospital, and we want to expand our understanding about how hospitals work and how uh, certain technology is used in hospitals. So there's this opportunity for us to uh, go to an interview and possibly work in the radiology department, which uses different types of scanners to study uh, parts of the body. So we uh, sit down for this interview with these doctors, and they ask us some questions. And they wanted you to answer the questions in your packet. And so they thought about the idea of 100 years ago, how things were very different compared to how they are now. There's a really good chance that children that were going to be born would have heart defects and they would die. Or, you know, if you had certain diseases, there wasn't necessarily a clear way to help you. So one of the first question they wanted you to think about was how has science-based technology improved diagnosis and treatment? And then they wanted to have you name three scanners used in hospitals and what type of tissues it's best to view them with. So then we spent some time having you guys think about these questions and then we went over what would be appropriate answers. So first we have the, um, we we'll talk about the first question. So how has technology made it easier for treatment and diagnosis? Well, now we can see tissues and organs uh, directly. We can look inside people uh, without cutting them open. So there's less surgery. We know exactly what's wrong with them because we can look at them and see exactly which part of the body is not maybe functioning the right way. The operations that we do have to do will be safer because we can make smaller incisions, uh, smaller cuts, and we can do the um, we can do the surgeries faster. And then that also means that people get healthier quicker, and so they uh, recover from the uh, surgery and then can go back to their lives. And we think about types of our um, uh, scanners, we have x-rays, MRIs, and ultrasounds. And x-rays, or uh, MRIs and ultrasounds are best used for soft tissue, where x-ray is best used for looking at bones. So, is that all you, you didn't necessarily score high enough to really get through this, but there's a need here is going to help train you to make sure that you understand everything you need in order to join the radiology department. So it's good to make sure that you understand as we go through this unit that you do have to remember the three types of um, machines that we use for diagnosis and then what we're going to use them in terms for treatment. Our x-rays, which again, looking for a dense material like the bones. Ultrasounds, which are for looking at soft tissue like the organs and muscles. And then the MRI, which is looking at soft tissue as well. Now, the ultrasound is not super clear versus the MRI, and so we can look at some examples of this. This would be like an x-ray, which you can very clearly see the different bones inside the individual, and so only the x-ray can produce this type of good image. Ultrasound, here we've got um, sections of the heart. So we are saying here's one section of the heart, here's the next section of the heart, here is another part, and here's another part. Uh, but it's not very clear, right? And so if we're going to um, look at the heart in more detail, what we would probably need to do would be look at, use an MRI. And then so an MRI, we can look really, uh, we can look at different parts of the inside of the person in terms of like different layers of them, of the tissue. And we get very, very detailed uh, images. And so uh, it's much easier to diagnose specific problems inside the body uh, with an MRI instead of ultrasound. So then after the video, we are, the interview, sorry, we met up with Miss Anita, and she's like, you know what, it's okay, you didn't get the job, there's still a lot of stuff you can learn, you're still pretty young, so she's going to help you uh, learn more about uh, MRIs and technology and how we can help people, uh, and she's also going to help you think about a very specific patient of hers and how technology was used to help him. So if you guys remember Jeffrey, we watched a series of videos in class where they were looking through uh, Jeffrey having some type of condition and what was wrong with him and then how he got treat and diagnosis and treatments. So Jeffrey was having problems 
uh, when he was doing exercise, when he was running around playing football at, at school. Uh, he kept getting headaches and he would get dizzy and sometimes he'd even black out. And so they, first he went to the hospital and they used a stethoscope to listen to his heart rate, right? And they weren't exactly sure what was wrong with him, but they knew that there was something definitely wrong with his heart rate and his blood pressure. They also took his blood pressure as well. So then they sent him to a radiologist. It's not a radiologist, sorry. A cardiologist. And then at the cardiologist, they wanted to collect more information about his heart by possibly doing a MRI scan. And so they wanted to get some detailed image of his heart so that they could help him uh, determine what is actually wrong. But before we got to that point, you guys played an activity where you're looking at thinking about what would happen if Jeffrey had this condition, but it was 100 years ago. And so we had this game where we had symptoms versus treatments. And so you guys took turns selecting different symptoms and then different treatment cards and reading them to each other and seeing whether or not the symptom actually helped with the treatment. And as you were reading these, you, you noticed that it didn't matter which symptom you got, any of the treatments that you received were all very general, and most of the time they weren't going to help you very much. So we're talking about a hundred years ago, it was really unlikely that whatever was wrong with you uh, was really well understood by doctors. And so what doctors might do as a treatment to try to fix you or try to help you with that symptoms would be kind of like guesswork. They wouldn't exactly know what it is that is that they need to do, and they're just kind of experimenting with different ideas and hoping for the best. Now, however, because of scanning technology, uh, we kind of take the guesswork out of diagnosis. We can look at specific parts of the body using MRIs and ultrasounds and x-rays. And so we can get a really good idea of what is wrong with an individual before we uh, start figuring out what would be the best way to treat them. So the treatment and diagnosis are really based on knowing what is exactly wrong with that person. So uh, we found out from the videos that Jeffrey went through an MRI and he they have determined that there is something wrong with his aorta. His aorta is possibly too narrow and so he's going to have to do a surgery where they will widen his aorta so that he can go back to being a normal healthy uh, teenager. So as we move through the rec next lesson, right, we're going to go into talking about more about technology and, meta and men how technology is helping with the treatments and also how uh, Jeffrey is going to get helped. So going into the second class of this part of the unit, we were talking about treatment. So we learned about how technology really helps diagnosis, help us figure out what is exactly wrong with someone. Now we need to figure out how is technology going to help us handle treatments. So if you remember, Jeffrey is having a hard time, right? Uh, he's got a heart condition, possibly has a narrow artery. And so they want you to think about 100 years ago, what could possibly uh, be done for him? We didn't necessarily have the technology to figure out exactly what was wrong with his heart. If they realized that it was something wrong with his heart, they'd have to do a surgery and have to be a big complex surgery versus the one that is actually available to Jeffrey. So they have to figure out how are we going to help fix his artery? How are we going to help uh, expand it? So we take a little bit of time to think about it if it was 100 years ago. And if we got symptoms, would your symptoms get worse or would the treatment actually get better. So then again, we played another little game, which is this game of chance. And so once again, you guys were randomly rolling dies, and then you're picking different chance cards. And those chance cards would tell you whether or not you survived, or you got better, or you got worse, and then died, uh, depending on what the doctors, uh, the different treatment that the doctors gave you. And playing this game, you also realize that a lot of the times, uh, the treatment didn't really do much to help you. You either couldn't afford it, or the doctor wouldn't really, it wouldn't be something that was really specific to your diagnosis, so it wouldn't actually fix the problem. Sometimes it would make the problem worse because it would, it would be the exact opposite of what it is that you should do. But every once in a while, sometimes they would get it correct and so that you would survive, but you maybe wouldn't fully recover. You would just be stuck with a, a permanent disease or a physical problem for the rest of your life. So when we think about Jeffrey, if we want to fix his uh, problem with it, having a narrow aorta and we want to help him as much as possible, we want to help him recover very quickly, right? We're going to use technology to help treat his condition. So when we go under the surgery, okay, we think about what it is that he's actually, what we're actually going to do. And so we're given these 
uh, images, uh, and we're supposed to match the uh, image of what's going to happen and what is our description of it. So here we've got the first one, okay, letter C, and we've got the layout of the arteries above his heart. And we see here is this narrow section of the artery, all right, and so that's what the problem is. So then if we were in terms of matching this up, we would see a narrow section is found in the main blood vessel, that is his artery. And we think about the next one, so well, now that we know where the problem is, we're going to do B. So we're going to insert this tiny little special medical balloon, it's not a regular balloon, it's very strong, it doesn't pop like a lot of you thought it would. Uh, and they're going to insert it through a small um, cut in his groin. And so that's going to move all the way from his groin all the way up to where his heart is. And that's a pretty far distance to travel. However, they can move that distance really accurately because they can use scanners like ultrasounds, right? To sh make sure that the, the balloon has been traveling in the right direction and is going to get all the way up to the aorta um, near his heart. Then what they'll do for the next one is that they will inflate the balloon. And by inflating the balloon, they're going to push the aorta outwards, okay, and cause it to widen. And then as it widens, it will start to maintain that shape if they leave it there for a little while. So now the aorta is actually quite big, it's its normal size. So then that leads to the last one here, which is the blood flow and blood pressure will return to normal because the artery is at a normal size, so here you can see it's much wider than it was before. Okay, and that's the procedure that they did for uh, Jerry, or sorry, Jeffrey, and it only required a small little incision, so they didn't have to cut open his chest, didn't have to go through his rib cage and, you know, go near his lungs and the muscles and everything around his chest area. They could just make a small little incision and travel through one part of the body to the another, and they can use scanners in order to keep track of everything that's happening inside the body to make sure that he gets a successful treatment. So as we've said before, uh, this type of treatment, if, uh, if we had to do open chest surgery, so if we actually had to open up his chest and cut from the outside all the way in, uh, that would actually take a really, really long time to recover because we're going to go through the chest muscles, we're going to have to break open the rib cages a little bit, we're going to have to move certain tissues out of the way, which is going to make it very uncomfortable as he recovers. And so, uh, it's not really a great idea for someone young like Jeffrey, who's still in school, to have to go through something like that if we don't need to. So using the, the procedure that we just talked about, Jeffrey can actually come in, do the procedure, and then be, leave the hospital in the same day or maybe even the next day, sorry, um, if he just stays overnight to make sure that he's okay, right? So because it's a much smaller cut, he can recover much faster than if it was a big open surgery. And again, thinking about scanning technology can help him get well quicker. We can use MRIs, we can use ultrasounds to check on his body to make sure that the surgery was successful. So they can take a look inside of his body to see if, you know, the arteries got back to its normal size, but they don't need to make another incision. Right? So they don't have to do any other surgeries on him to check. So using x-ray scanners, using ultrasounds, we can take a look inside. We can make sure that the procedure is done really well, and then we can have the procedure done with really tiny cuts. And so the patient is going to recover much, much faster. So thinking of all this, we can see that new technology has allowed us to uh, create a lot of benefits to patients, and a lot of uh, ways for them to help recover versus 100 years ago. And so now we are thinking about that 100 years ago versus now. And so you guys had filled this out in your note packet. And so now you can kind of quiz yourself, see if you can also fill this out again without looking in your packet. So you can pause the video, All right? Okay, so we go through this. 100 years ago versus now, diagnosis was not very precise. It was not accurate versus now it can be very, very precise. We know exactly what's wrong with a person. Availability of the treatment 100 years ago, it was only offered to a few people. Not everyone could get treatment. Now, everyone can get treatment, and in some places in the world, the treatment is free. <laughs> so, sorry. A hundred years ago, safety, right? A lot of people died, unfortunately, if they did have to do surgeries because they weren't very accurate. And they weren't uh, necessarily the best um, use of information or technology available. 
where now we can cure most people. So more often than not, people leave a hospital um, cured of what happened to them or what was wrong with them more than uh, end up dying in the hospital. And we look at the size of the cuts. They used to do very, very large cuts. They'd have to break through your chest wall and things like that, especially if they're going to be doing a surgery on the heart. Versus now we can use tiny, tiny little cuts, only the biggest, uh, only the size of the cut that is going to be needed in order to do the procedure. And since that, uh, 100 years ago, your recovery time might have taken months or even years, where now um, it could be hours, you know, a couple of days, and a person will feel much better and will be able to go home. Now, even though MRIs helped us determine what was wrong with Jeffrey, and x-rays and ultrasounds can help us make sure that he recovers really very quickly during the procedure, after the procedure, so that he can go home, uh, they're not perfect machines. So there are some limitations, there are some things that we're starting to improve on. So there are issues, we could say drawbacks, to using an MRI. So if we look at the MS MRI chart, we can think about whether something is an advantage, disadvantage, or it could be an issue that people should be aware of. Maybe it's, it only affects a small group of people. So you can pause the video again, go through this, see if you can quiz yourself, right? All right, so you've unpaused it. So then let's go through this. Let's try to find uh, uh, some of our advantages. So let's doctor see your tissues and organs without getting cut open. So that would be an advantage. So I'll put a little bit of green there. Uh, images are more detailed than those from other scanners. That would be an advantage, right? Uh, big magnet machine needs cool liquid and it makes it expensive. No, that's going to be a disadvantage. And that's also leading into the first one here, which costs a lot. So those two being connected to each other very very high costs right using expensive material to run it and that's one of the reasons why it is so expensive some uh, obese people cannot fit into the scanners that's going to be uh, kind of an um, something that people need to be aware of it is a disadvantage in some but it's not a disadvantage for everybody so it's just kind of an in-between people with pacemakers cannot have MRIs again that's something people are going to need to be aware of Okay, it doesn't affect everyone, but it does affect some people. Uh, you need to lie still in the MRI machine for at least 20 minutes, which makes it difficult for young children. Uh, I would also say that sounds like it would be kind of an, uh, an issue for some people, but that's a just a disadvantage in general. No one's going to like lying inside of that super loud machine, regardless if you're a young child or an adult. It's super loud in there, right? So it's not going to be that great for anybody. Uh, some patients that are claustrophobic won't be able to use the MRI machine. Okay, that's probably right, just going to affect a small group of people, but it is something that they need to be aware of. Machines make a lot of noise during the scan. That's definitely a disadvantage for everybody, right? Not great. Uh, it's safer than using an x-ray because there's no radiation. That's good, right? That is an advantage. Uh, it can spot problems early so they can be treated before they get serious. That's a big advantage, right? It's the main reason why we'd want to use the MRI because we can get such detailed information. Chemicals that you uh, use to make the MRI cleaner, or scanners uh, clearer, uh, could give problems for people with kidney problems. So that's that's going to be a kind of a middle line right there. Not so great for some people. Oh, that's the different color. Is this color? There we go. And then the bones do not show up on the MRI scan. Now you might think that's a disadvantage, but that actually is, that's an advantage. If we wanted to see bones, we already have uh, x-rays to look at bones, and x-rays can be pretty clear. But uh, MRIs, we don't necessarily want to see bones. We want to see all the other soft tissue that's inside of the bones. So if the bones showed up on an MRI scan, we might not be able to get such good pictures of other parts of the body. Okay, so there are some problems there's some issues that we would like to try to fix with MRI technology as we move forward. And so one of the nice things is that technology, uh, as technology gets better, it gets cheaper. Uh, the medicine world or the medical world in terms of diagnosis and treatment is going to have more options for people. Okay, so she feels that you're ready for your interview now. But before we can move on, we needed to make sure that you guys also understood the parts of the heart. So we've been spending a lot of time talking about Jeffrey and his heart condition, but you do have to know all the other parts of the heart at this grade level. And so some information about it. So we're going to kind of go through it. If you remember this from class, you want to quiz yourself, you can go ahead and stop the video and just kind of see if you can guess what are all the labels and what are all the pieces of information. 
All right, but if not, okay, you've unpaused it. So let's go through this and make sure that you do understand exactly what it is that you need to know about the heart. So first off, our path of our heart. So on one side of the body, all right, we have heart blood coming in this way, moving down to the lower part of this heart and then up here, all right, going in that direction. And then blood will also come back this direction through the heart, through this lower part here, and then back out through that part. Okay, so as blood is leaving the heart from the top direction, that means it's going off to the lungs. Typically, we uh, color this blood uh, in a bluish color, even though it's not really blue blood, it's more of just a dark red. Um, we do that because it doesn't really have a lot of oxygen in it because it's already been passing through all parts of the body. And the body's been using that oxygen as, you know, taking it out to keep all the cells healthy. So now as the blood passes through this side of the heart, Okay, it's now going to go off to the lungs in order to get oxygen. So on the other side, the idea of blood coming back into the heart, it's going to be coming back from the lungs. And then everything else will be going off to the body. So from the lungs, the lung, the blood will come back. Now it's, we use a bright red color because it's full of oxygen, a lot more oxygen than other parts of the body are going to need. And so the hot blood will get pumped through the heart and then go to all of the other parts of the body in order to... Uh, you know, supply oxygen to all those different cells. So in addition to understanding how blood moves through in and out of the heart and where it's going, you need to know the different parts. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> sorry. One thing you need to make sure you understand is that when we talk about a heart in a diagram, <clears throat> we have the left side, there we go, and the right side. And even though you're looking at the screen and you're looking at what you think is the left side of the screen and the right side of the screen, you think, oh, those must be switched. They're not switched because we're thinking about the heart in terms of it was inside your own body. So if you look down right now, your left side of your body is this side of the diagram. And your right side of your own body is this side of the diagram. So when we're talking about left side versus right side, okay, you need to make sure you understand what it is that we're referring to. Okay, so with our blood flow, right, going this direction, like that, we're also going to look at the different sides of the heart. So going forward, we have uh, on the left side, so the right side of the heart, we have the vena cava, which is the largest vein, which is what's bringing blood to the heart. Then from the vena cava, we go down into the upper chamber of the heart, which is called an atrium. And so there's an atrium on the right side and there's an atrium on the left side. So we have it right atrium and then the other side would be called the left atrium. So we have our vena cava, here's our right atrium. From the atrium, the blood then moves down into a ventricle, the larger part of the heart that's in the bottom. So we have a right ventricle, and then we also have a left ventricle on the other side. Okay? So here's our left atrium, right? And then we have our left ventricle, right? And then as it leaves the heart, it's going to go through the aorta which is going to show up in just a second, but up here, that's our aorta, which is the, our main artery leaving the heart, and that's the, the one that Jeffrey had some problems with. We also see in our diagram these special one-way doors. You see that they're kind of like these arrow-shaped kind of flaps, right? So those are special one-way doors because as blood moves in one direction, it makes, makes sure that blood moves in one direction as we're dealing with the heart. So, for example... If we've got, this is our one-way door, right? And so we've got blood on one side. All right, and so the heart pumps, and so the heart pumps, the blood is going to move through this one-way door to the other side, okay? Now, when this happens, and the blood ends up on the other side, these doors are going to get pushed shut because as the blood ends up on the other side, okay, no matter which direction the blood gets pushed, it can't go this way against the flow of blood. It can't go the wrong direction because when it pushes against the sides of those doors, the doors shut really, really tightly. And that's why we call them these one-way doors is because they make sure 
that the blood goes the correct direction, which is forward. Okay, so we have our one-way valves or one-way doors. If we are divide the heart into half, our left side and our right side, right? Our right side, so we divide it kind of middle like that. The right side, that's going to be the darker bluish colored blood, which is actually just darker red, but normally in diagrams you'll see it as a blue. Okay, and the other side will be the right, uh, would be the left side, and that would be the, um, with the lots of brighter, brighter red coloring blood. It has lots of oxygen in it. So the bluish coloring is because of the low oxygen, where the reddish coloring is about having really, really high levels of oxygen. All right. And then some other things that we can remember, you can think about the heart. It's about the size of your fists. All right. Normally, it beats about 72 beats per minute. It can be lower or higher, depending on your activity levels and how healthy you are. And because we are mammals, it is a four-chamber heart. So we have four sections, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. If we are looking at the heart of birds or lizards of fish, we get uh, less chambers. So it goes from four to three, then three to two, right? So they have uh, simpler body forms and they have simpler hearts where we have a larger body, more complex body, or mammals do, and so we have a larger, more complex heart. Okay, so hopefully all this makes sense to you. If you're confused, you can go back and rewatch some sections or you can come ask me for help on things. And hopefully this video has helped get you prepared for your tests.